Well, I don't change the mood, but um, it's, we could sit here like this for another hour or two. Let the world do what it wants, but we are here together. And I like the concept of the 12 powers. I know I get accused of talking about them a lot. But this one in particular has been a vital one for us. This is the fifth week of the month of zeal. And I can see you've all remembered the colour orange. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Jenny did, did you, Jenny? Oh, good, okay, full, full marks. And I should, who? I should have, um, oh, there we are. That's sort of orange. I think that's an next, I think it's terracotta. Your hair's orange. Okay. Oh, they're out of control here. Um, but anyway, I, I really can't remember what next month is. Um, so anyway, I think, it's your, well, that's the main thing, Wendy. It's Wendy's birthday. And uh, what's that? Elimination, is it? So, okay, I don't know what colour it is. This should fall off our lips, you know. How, eh? So, can, can someone tell me what it is? Russet? Russet? Russet. Yeah. So, and we've got it all up on the back wall here. Jeanette's done all the slides. What is it, Jeanette? It's elimination. Elimination. Let go. And what colour? Oh, it's uh, yeah. russet. Russet. So really, your bag is russet, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you're ahead of us. I'm already ahead. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. All right. Well, look. This is the last week of Zeal, and I knew our next speaker had something to say about this. But we talked and we talked, and at last we've got it. Our president is going to. Uh, let herself be known, and she's going to tell us what she knows about Zeal. Would you welcome Sheila? Hello, everybody on Zoom. Good morning. Hope you're well. Well. It's okay. Hi, Sheila. Hi. Hi. And hi, everybody else. Good morning to you. Well, <clears throat> oh. okay. well, I'm, I think, on the other side of the colour wheel, actually, but um, I'm sure this, this is supposed to be a peaceful, happy colour anyway, so, you know, and, and we say every time we come to our unity gatherings, let peace begin with me, and that applies to all of us, so. Okay, what is it to be zealous? Well, I only hear this word zeal when our dear Reverend Bill quotes Charles Fillmore's famous affirmation. And I'm glad he does this, because zeal is not a word that is used very often nowadays. And as Fillmore tells us, to be without zeal is to lack the zest for life itself. When we contemplate what this deeply spiritual man was able to achieve in one lifetime, I'm talking about Charles Fillmore, but you've achieved a lot too, <laughs> <laughs> um, We do well to take note of the value of zeal. And here is the affirmation, just in case you've forgotten. I fairly sizzle with zeal and enthusiasm and spring forth with a mighty faith yeah, yeah, yeah. to do the things that ought to be done by well, I mean, me. It's on behind, the words... That? I have a few other words. Oh, okay. okay. Sorry. Yeah, you may read it. <laughs> the words zeal and enthusiasm are mentioned here side by side. And this suggests that Fillmore saw zeal and enthusiasm as somewhat distinct. And he is listing two qualities that differ in some respect. Now, the dictionary definitions of zeal may relate to feelings of enthusiasm, exuberance, excitement, activity, gusto, passion, etc. But, as has been pointed out before, zealousness can easily be taken to extremes. An excess of zeal can cause immense problems for us, both individually and collectively at the social level. As Fillmore says, if our 
inborn human attributes are only partially developed, the consequence is that a person will be open to faults of thought and judgment. It is up to us to learn how to use these powers or abilities in the correct proportion and to act only in balance and harmony with other considerations. When we do not succeed in this and act from the sheer intensity of zeal, we see around us a world in conflict, opposition and confusion. But if we think about this picture a bit more, all this evidence only serves to draw us back to the necessity of doing our individual spiritual work and making every effort to understand the correct operation of these inherent powers and abilities. So each month here at Unity of Melbourne, we continue to spin the wheel and take the time to focus on one or other of these powers in turn. We encourage ourselves, oh, we regard this learning as fundamental to our growth as spiritual beings, and we encourage ourselves to understand the gifts each one brings and what role it plays in shaping our experience of living. By doing so, we hope to become fully alive and well-functioning human beings. Unity regards this as a vital step to becoming the people we were intended to be within the whole dynamic of creation. It was Charles Fillmore's contention that it is only when we know the workings of all the faculties on all three planes of consciousness, spirit, soul and body, that we will be able to fathom the intricate processes of man's mind in the regenerative birth as symbolised by the life of Jesus. A mighty aim indeed. Leaving the theory of regeneration aside for now, it is only when these intricate processes are understood at all levels that humanity will be able to pass from the natural to the divine state of being and consciousness, another mighty name. As Charles assessed the situation, these 12 faculties are in a weakened condition in most men and women because they have succumbed to negative thought. And so they have been sleepwalking their way through life. This is explained by lack of spiritual understanding. And the inevitable result of this condition is that all our faculties have fallen into inharmonious action through ages of wrong thinking. Therefore, our work is to become conscious of our responsibility to the ongoing spiritual evolution of the human race. Like it or not, we are created beings and in this way, made in the image and likeness of God. We create with mind power, and through the process of thought, what we think creates our reality and must eventually manifest in the outer realm. This works either positively or negatively. But the good news is we are empowered to choose which way we go. This happens through the law of mind action, sorry, the law of mind action, which follows the sequence of idea, then thought, then outer expression, which is called manifestation. Our inner thoughts will manifest eventually, and that can seem quite scary, but there is no escaping this fact. It is a truth of our existence that thought creates the world we live in, inwardly, and outwardly. Charles believed that reawakening these 12 powers would be essential in the development of the perfect ideal of humankind. Unity sees this ideal as the claiming of the inner Christ consciousness. This consciousness lies in the center of our spiritual DNA 
And if that seems a bit spooky for you, well, it's almost Halloween. <laughs> anyway, the highest expression of zeal is an unflagging forward interest in knowing, speaking and doing good. We must remember that the powers of understanding and wisdom help to temper zeal, so that its enthusiasm and intensity are directed to grow spiritually and express the Christ nature. However, success, Charles says, would only come to those who were zealous enough to keep practicing in spite of apparent failure. The revealing word states, zeal is ardor, enthusiasm, the inward fire of the soul that urges humankind onward, regardless of intellectual mind, of caution and conservation. Understanding this forward movement, no matter what the cost, makes it easy to see why zeal is predisposed to lead us astray. And yet, it appears that the quality of understanding, wisdom, faith, determination and perseverance are also required as part of being zealous enough to succeed. Simon, the Canaan, <laughs> books have problems saying this, the Cananean represents the power of zeal, which is thought to be located at the mandala, the base of the limbic brain. And this means that there must be other balancing powers brought in to keep us spiritually centred and well-grounded in all we do. Ironically, this is probably the last topic I wanted to talk about at this moment, because to tell you the truth, I have not been experiencing too much zeal during the last couple of weeks due to a combination of external circumstances, both personal and global. I was feeling disturbed, deflated and somewhat adrift. And I followed a winding trail through various responses as I questioned myself about what was happening and missing for me over this period. As often happens though, this is also why it was an excellent topic for me to take on at this moment. Because to be without zeal is to be without the zest for living. I needed to turbocharge myself with zeal and tap into something that would boost my spirits. This was not something that could be solved by intellectual thought, but more simply by sitting in silence and just allowing my spiritual energy to recharge me of itself and restore my motivation. I needed to reach inwards with a bit more determination and tune out to what was happening in the outer world. The thoughts coming to manifest action around the world were not inspiring or pretty, and my faith was being bombarded by sorrow and doubt robbing me of the confidence to continue living with any firm sense of direction or much enjoyment. So zeal must have a mercurial and volatile nature since it can be expressed either positively or negatively and can quickly move from one to the other, influenced by emotions. I conclude that since the power of zeal only comes into visibility, through its alignment with our choices and concerns, we need to ceaselessly watch and be aware of what we are feeling. Otherwise, we are at risk of allowing zeal to attach to what is undesirable in our mental world before we even have a chance to deal with our true feelings. In my case, it was sadness and anxiety that compromised my ability to feel the zest for life. Another example would be feelings of anger. How often have we felt a sense of outrage or shock that is so deeply felt that it is almost impossible to consciously hold in our emotion? The feeling is so strong it makes us physically restless and we have an urgent need to do something, almost anything in order to cope with what we are experiencing. 
when we cannot contain our experience, we project it outwards onto blaming something or someone else. And while there is nothing wrong with feeling angry, we must recognize that this is a feeling, that this feeling, we must recognize the feeling for what it actually is. We have to know that this is an emotion we must attempt to move through and beyond rather than nurse. Otherwise, if we do not, we remain trapped and stuck in that energy. If we are not able to move through our anger, it affects all our decisions, which potentially have devastating consequences. I am reminded of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's five stages of grief, beginning with the denial phase that slows down the process of adjusting and absorbing what seems unbearable in the moment. This is an instinctive defence that prevents us from being completely overwhelmed. But the second stage of grief is anger, which provides us with some kind of emotional outlet and allows us to forget how vulnerable we are really feeling underneath. The anger helps disguise a sense of personal powerlessness. However, if we act on it without reflection, we are likely to have to apologise and may deeply come to regret our decisions. Humanity is at a point now when it has become vital for us all to learn how to process our most powerful feelings before they become fatally destructive to the world at large. We must learn how to come to terms with our anger and grief by moving on to reach the point of acceptance, which includes the acceptance of the good, the bad and the ugly. What we resist persists. But we should not despair at the horrors and absurdities we see around us because these things do not have to be permanent. This is a valuable insight for us. We can and must make other choices. The spiritual value of love can serve to neutralise anger and hatred if we allow it to do so. If we choose to commit to pursue the highest state of consciousness, we will process all our experience through that power of spiritual love and persevere through the transformation of our emotional reaction of judgment. And this is what Fillmore has in mind when he encourages us to be zealous. Both he and Myrtle spoke continually about the need for the individual to pursue soul culture which they both regarded as highly important in the evolution of the human race. In their teaching, zeal is considered the impulse and urge that moves humanity along the evolutionary journey of spiritual empowerment. The Fillmores always encourage people to work zealously on their own spiritual consciousness. This was the individual's responsibility and this would serve to uplift the collective mentality. They believed this was our primary duty. The revealing word instructs us, turn a portion of your soul to do God's will, to the establishment of the kingdom within you. Do not put all your enthusiasm into teaching, preaching, healing and helping others. Help yourself. Do not let your zeal run away with your judgment. When zeal and judgment work together, great things can be accomplished. A passage from Charles Fillmore's Keeper True Lent argues that spiritual harmony in humankind depends largely on the right relation of the inner and outer realms of our consciousness. Expression is the law of life. Whatever is expressed, becomes manifest. The unity movement is all about the development of human consciousness so that the right ideas are expressed outwardly through the law of mind action. It is through the expression of divine ideas and the Christ consciousness that the ongoing expansion of creation can take place and for our own sakes we are urged 
to seek the manifestation of the ideas from divine mind. Life is gift. And in order to ensure we feel a strong zest for living, we must feel truly zealous about our intentions. Then we have to find a reason and a purpose for life that will inspire us to give our best each and every day. And by dedicating ourselves to this aim, we set up the optimum conditions for our spiritual growth and expansion. We will find that our personal consciousness will grow naturally through engagement with our projects along the way. Zeal comes into operation with the individual's choice to put their energy towards something that is deeply meaningful to them. This takes passion and commitment. What you choose depends on who you, sorry, depends on you and what level of consciousness you are operating from. And a good question to ask yourself repeatedly is what is worth waking up for each day? If you find that answer, you will activate your inbuilt power of zeal and it will work zealously to support you. Love and peace. Thank you, Sheila. Would you give her another round of applause? I'm getting carried away. I'm glad that we've got this on Zoom. You'll be able to see this um, when Wayne puts it up later today. Wasn't that amazing? There's something in there for all of us. Thank you, Lorraine. I can see you clapping there. And um, a few of the others there.